Once you have an idea of how much current your device will use, you can begin to estimate battery life. Do note that it is extremely difficult to precisely calculate how long a battery will last. This is because different manufacturers use different processes when making the batteries, and a variety of factors like temperature and current draw will ultimately affect how long a battery lasts. You can find batteries in all sorts of chemistries like lead acid, nickel metal hydride, and lithium polymer, but we'll stick with the simple non-rechargeable alkaline cells in this episode. It'll make our calculations a little easier, especially when dealing with cutoff voltages. The best way to determine how long batteries will last in your device is to just test them. Turn on your device and time how long it takes for the batteries to wear out with regular use. But that's not always feasible, especially if you're hoping that your device will last for a year on some batteries. Sometimes, batteries will list a nominal capacity in milliamp hours on the battery itself, or sometimes you'll find it on the vendor's product page. This can be used for a very quick and dirty back-of-the-envelope calculation if you need a starting place. Let's use that vendor-provided capacity rating of 1.14 amp hours for a AAA battery, which is equal to 1,140 milliamp hours. Then, let's say our device pulls 100 milliamps on average. We can estimate the battery's life by dividing the capacity by the expected current draw. So, we divide 1,140 by 100. We see that the milliamp units cancel and we're left with 11.4 hours, which is equal to 11 hours and 24 minutes. I'll be honest, I have no idea where the vendors get that number from. It could be the total capacity of the battery, or maybe they assume a cutoff voltage where you can't use the last little bit of energy. Either way, I would always assume that this is a best case scenario under ideal conditions. So, let's get our hands dirty and dig into a real data sheet to get a better idea of what's going on. If you look at any good data sheet for a battery, you should find something that looks like this, a discharge curve or discharge characteristic curve that shows how the battery behaves under some load. I don't know what a tape game digital audio is, but I presume it's some type of handheld device that's ideally used an hour each day. Regardless, we can see that as the batteries drain, they slowly lose their voltage. Here is an ideal discharge curve. You might think that a AA or AAA battery maintains 1.5 volts over its lifetime until at some point the chemical reactions reach equilibrium and the battery is dead. However, in reality, the battery slowly loses voltage over time as it's used. Also, most consumer electronics can't operate below a certain voltage. This is known as a cutoff voltage, which we'll call V-cut. A well-designed product will operate down to 0.8 volts per alkaline cell and then stop there. If you look at where the cutoff voltage intersects the real discharge curve, you'll see that batteries actually last less time than if they followed the ideal curve. When it comes to using batteries in a real circuit, you rarely use just one. You'll generally want to put them in a pack like this. If you connect them in series, you will multiply the voltage by the number of cells in your pack. However, the capacity stays the same. If you connect them in parallel, the voltage stays the same, but the capacity is multiplied by the number of cells. In truth, you will rarely ever connect alkaline cells in parallel, as you can usually just buy a bigger cell, like a D battery, if you need more capacity. Note that I gave the nominal voltage. So, with one cell, your product would need to work with 1.5 volts down to 0.8 volts through the course of the battery's life. With two cells, you should expect 3 volts down to 1.6 volts. With three, expect 4.5 volts down to 2.4 volts. With four cells, you can expect 6 volts down to 3.2 volts, and so on. In the late 1890s, the German scientist Wilhelm Peukert formally showed that a battery's capacity was related to its discharge rate. And while Peukert's law was developed initially for lead-acid batteries, the same idea also applies to alkaline cells. Back to our datasheet, we find another chart that shows the battery's capacity with respect to its discharge rate. If we draw 25 milliamps at an average rate from this AAA, we see that we get a little over 1200 milliamp hours. However, if we try to crank nearly half an amp out of it, we get maybe a third of the capacity. You'll also note that this particular chart assumes that we're draining the battery to 0.8 volts and gives the capacity just to that point. The constant current performance chart also gives another example with three curves, each representing a different cutoff voltage. Let's pretend that our new device isn't as well designed, and it only goes down to 1 volt per cell while drawing an average of 100 milliamps from the battery pack. 
So we find the point on the 1.0 volt curve that intersects with 100 milliamps on the x-axis. Note that this is a log-log plot, so pay attention to how the numbers are listed on the axes. We trace that over to the y-axis, and we see that we can expect about 8 hours of service from this AAA. This is a good deal less than the initial 11.4 hours we saw earlier, even taking into account that we are looking at batteries from different manufacturers. There's one more big factor to consider, and that's temperature. Our performance charts both show that the batteries were tested at 21 degrees Celsius. Below them, we can see that an alkaline battery's performance severely degrades as temperature decreases. For our purposes, we'll assume that our device will operate mostly indoors or in a similar environment. Here's the problem. Everything I just told you is still not very accurate. Battery companies made up this idea of milliamp hours to make estimating battery life much easier, but it's still not a measure of the battery's true capacity. A battery is an energy storage device, and as such, we should be talking about how much energy is in there. And a milliamp hour is not a unit of energy. Energy is the ability for something to do work, and it is measured in joules. One joule is also equal to one watt second. A watt second is applying one watt of power to something over the course of one second. We know that from Ohm's power law that power is equal to voltage times current. And so one amp drawn at one volt is equal to one watt, a measure of power. To get a unit of energy out of this, we would need to measure the power usage over a period of time, say one second. By multiplying one volt by one amp by one second, we would get one watt second, which is equal to a joule. Note that this takes voltage and current into account. We've been working with milliamp hours. One milliamp hour is equal to one milliamp flowing through a point for one hour. And we can see that it is equal to 3.6 amp seconds, since there are 1,000 milliamps in one amp and 3,600 seconds in one hour. But just by looking at the units, we can see that an amp second is not equal to a volt amp second or a watt second, also known as a joule. So milliamp hours is not a measure of energy. The best way to measure a battery's capacity then would be something related to joules, like the watt second or the milliwatt hour. The problem with this is that it can be difficult to measure milliwatt hours with your device. However, there are some times when you want to use milliwatt hours as opposed to milliamp hours. A linear voltage regulator acts like a variable resistor to maintain a steady output voltage. As a result, the input voltage must be higher than the output voltage. In this theoretical example, the batteries would slowly lose their voltage from 6 volts to 3 volts, while the output to your load is maintained at a steady 3 volts. Once the batteries reach 3 volts, the linear regulator, in theory, would no longer work, and your device will shut down. While linear regulators are easier to use, they are not very efficient. You see this excess voltage between V in and V out? All that is burned off as heat in the linear regulator as it is essentially a large resistor that tries to maintain a steady, lower voltage. If the input is 6 volts and the output is 3 volts, the regulator is 50% efficient. And, because linear regulators act like resistors, the input current is the same as the output current. Assuming our device draws a constant current, the input and output current will be steady, at least until the batteries drop below their cutoff voltage. So, if we're using a linear regulator to provide a steady voltage to our device, it's best to use the constant current calculations. This is just like our example from earlier. If we are using a linear regulator and our device consumes 100 milliamps, it means our batteries must output 100 milliamps. So we look at the datasheet's constant current plot. With a 3 volt cutoff and 3 cells, it means we have a 1 volt cutoff per cell. So we find where the 1 volt cutoff line meets the 100 milliamp line. Trace that over to the y-axis to see that we should expect about 8 hours of service from our batteries. The other type of voltage regulator is the switching regulator, which uses active components like transistors to pulse the input voltage to maintain the output voltage. In this example, we'll show a step-down converter, also known as a buck converter, that takes an input voltage greater than 3 volts and converts it to 3 volts. Notice that like the linear regulator, it also stops working when the batteries dip below 3 volts. Unlike a linear regulator, however, the buck converter can use the excess voltage. To accomplish this, the switching regulator attempts to make the power output equal to the power input, minus any inefficiencies in the regulator itself. Remember that power is equal to voltage times current. 
So to make this input-output power relationship work, if our output current stays constant, the input current can be lowered while the battery voltage is higher than the output voltage. The input current curve will look much like an inverted input voltage curve as the regulator tries to maintain constant power. This can save us a lot of wasted energy. That being said, there are a few catches with switching regulators. They are usually more expensive, require additional components, can inject unwanted noise into your system, and are more difficult to analyze. So if you decide to go with a switching regulator, you would want to calculate battery life using the constant power estimates instead of constant current. Let's take a look at an example. We'll start with the same simple device as before. It needs three volts to run, which is also our cutoff voltage, and it draws a constant 100 milliamps. We'll multiply voltage by current to see that our device uses 0.3 watts, or 300 milliwatts of power. The switching regulator's operation can be simplified into this equation. The output power is equal to the input power multiplied by the regulator's efficiency, which is a number between 0 and 1, and often expressed as the Greek letter eta. So we plug in our output power and estimate the regulator's efficiency. Most switching regulators' efficiency can change depending on a variety of factors, but 85% is usually a good average guess for these types of calculations. We solve for PN and find that the input power is equal to about 353 milliwatts. This is the total power provided by all three batteries. We can divide that number by three to determine the power provided by each cell, which is about 118 milliwatts in this case. This is the number we'll need to look at the datasheet. We'll want to look at the constant power performance chart for our switching power supply example. If you remember from the constant current plot, a 1.0 volt cutoff point was very close to a 0.8 volt cutoff, so we'll use the 0.9 volt cutoff here as a close approximation. We can also guess where 118 milliwatts is and draw a line up from that. We look at where it intersects with the 0.9 volt curve and determine that we can expect between 8 and 9 hours of service from our AAA batteries. As you can see, trying to estimate battery life from power is quite difficult. If you use a switching regulator, it should give you more battery life than, say, a linear regulator. All of the things being equal, the switching regulator will just be more efficient. That being said, I still recommend using the constant current technique to calculate battery life. It's easier to do, and besides, it'll give you a more conservative estimate. The last load type we have not talked about yet is the constant resistance. This is useful for passive-only type circuits, like a flashlight. As the voltage on the batteries drops, the current also drops. This makes it difficult to estimate battery life, because as the current changes, the capacity also changes. If you need to use this type of load, I recommend taking a look at the industry standard tests on the datasheet. They should offer a couple of plots with constant resistance loads to give you an idea of what kind of battery life you can expect. To summarize all this, we need to keep a few things in mind. First, you need to know your cutoff voltage, as most electronics will not operate down to the very end of a battery's life. Second, remember that as current draw increases, battery life decreases. Third, think about your environment. Generally, as temperature goes down, battery capacity also goes down. In cold situations, a lithium cell might perform better than an alkaline cell. And fourth, think about your load type. Is it a constant current load? Is it a constant power load? Or is it a constant resistance load? To make life easier, DigiKey has a great little battery calculator tool on their website. Let's use that original, seemingly made up nominal capacity of 1140 milliamp hours. We'll use our example of 100 milliamps for current draw. DigiKey leaves in this flub factor of 0.7. Flub factor, of course, being the technical term for a variety of things such as vendors overestimating the capacity, lack of stating cutoff voltage, and a failure to account for the change in capacity as the discharge rate changes. But hey, that's incredibly close to the 8 hours we got from our more rigorous calculations. To bring this around to our Arduino IoT node, we need to figure out how to get it to run on a couple of AAA batteries for one year. We'll assume that we're putting the batteries in series to get the voltage we need. With such a low discharge rate, we can assume that we're close to the maximum capacity of this battery, 
So we'll use 1200 milliamp hours. Divide this number by the number of hours in a year, 8760, and we see that our average current draw needs to be under 0.137 milliamps, or 137 microamps. Just to be extra safe, we can apply that 0.7 flub factor to see that we should be averaging around 100 microamps. All batteries will slowly lose their charge over time. Lucky for us, alkaline cells have some of the best shelf life, losing only 2-3% of their capacity in a year. As a result, we should not need to worry about this, especially if we go with the very conservative 100 microamp average draw. If you want to use an alkaline battery for longer, or you are considering other chemistries, you will need to take the self-discharge rate into account. In conclusion, it's really, really hard to calculate exact battery life. If you'd like a precise number, your best bet is to pull out a stopwatch and time how long your device lasts while running on batteries. The rest of this is more or less a guess. The good news is that we were able to come up with a figure for determining how much current we're allowed to draw with our sensor node if we hope to have it last a year on some AAA batteries. If you'd like to follow along with this series, please subscribe and happy hacking! <laughs>